Hello, today we're going to talk about work papers. Uh, it's a little more than work papers. We're actually going to have some content in here beside the work papers, but uh, the work papers are a big part of what I want to talk about today. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Appendix A is the lead sheet. All we're going to talk about are, are parts inventory. But you'll notice Miller Motor Company has new cars, new trucks, used cars, used trucks. They've got multiple inventories. So we use a lead sheet to bring those accounts together. Excuse me. On their balance sheet, they're going to report $3,729,000 in inventory. Part of that will be parts. Part of it will be new cars. Part of it will be new trucks. And we bring that together with the lead sheet. So all the accounts that are going to be included rolled together for the uh, balance sheet or income statement uh, will be rolled together on a lead sheet. The, notice the top part of the work papers, work paper one, work paper two, is exactly the same. So we've got Miller Motor Company uh, inventory, parts inventory. So who we're auditing, what account we're auditing, what sub account we're auditing, who did the work and the date they did it. Uh, the nature of the test, substantive test, the details of account balances, that will be the same for all of our parts inventory work papers. The objective will be the same. Uh, to determine if parts inventory is materially overstated. The assertions, we're worried primarily about existence and accuracy, valuation, and allocation. So those are the two assertions we're most concerned about. Uh, a tolerable misstatement has been set at 200,000 by the parts partner. Uh, procedure, we selected a sample, random sample of 387, blah, blah, blah. So this upper part will be the same for work papers, one, two, whatever, whenever. <clears throat> then we go through the procedure in detail. Now, we do this for two reasons. One is to document what we did in chapter five, where we're gonna get sued and go to court. Uh, so we want to have this well documented in the work papers. Uh, chances are good you're going to be gone by the time the accounting firm gets sued, if they get sued. So this has to be well documented. I don't think we do a good job of stressing documentation in our auditing classes. The second purpose of this work paper is that the staff auditor next year uh, can follow what you did. Uh, my favorite auditor used to say, you can't audit without last year's work papers. Because most of the time, what you do is you look at what they did last year and you do it again this year. The sample size may vary, may increase, decrease. Uh, there be, may be minor variations, but you're going to look at last year's work paper to provide a great deal of guidance on how to perform the procedure. <clears throat> at the bottom, notice that we form a conclusion. That's essential. We have to form a conclusion, uh, obtain sufficient appropriate evidence in order to reach a reasonable conclusion on which the opinion will be based. Okay. There are four things that can happen when we're auditing financial statements or an account. So we're auditing inventory. Two of those are good. Inventory is fairly presented and we issue an unmodified opinion. That's good. That makes us happy. Uh, inventory is materially overstated and we issue an adverse opinion. Ooh, that's correct. I hate to say it's good, but it's correct. The other situation is inventory is fairly presented and we issue an adverse opinion. That's a problem, but it's never going to happen. And the reason is the CFO and CEO have too much riding on it. 
So if I'm the CFO, I probably have several hundred thousand dollars wrapped up in stock options and bonuses. What's going to happen to my stock options and bonuses if the auditor issues an adverse opinion? So in my heart of hearts, I know inventory is fairly presented. So I'm going to, even if the auditor says, if you want me to re-audit inventory, I'm going to charge you an extra $50,000 or whatever. I'm going to agree to it. I may be mad. I may be upset with the auditor, but I'm going to pay for the $50,000 for the additional audit work with company money and the stock options and the bonus are my money. No matter what anybody tells you, uh, I'm more concerned about my money than company money. So uh, the CEO and CFO are always going to make sure that the auditor doesn't issue an adverse opinion when inventory is fairly presented. What we're really wor worried about is the situation where inventory is materially overstated and our results are erroneous and we issue an unmodified opinion. Nobody's going to complain. So the client has no incentive to say, oh, I think you got that wrong. Uh, we believe our inventory is materially overstated. The client has virtually no incentive to tell us to do that. Uh, again, this comes up to chapter five where we're going to find out in three or four years when we get sued. Um, but so we're really worried about inventory being materially overstated and reissuing an unmodified report. Bingo. That's what we're worried about. Now, the problem is written that we've got $200,000 of tolerable misstatement. I, and if we divide that by 1,703, we get 117.44. Since we're dealing with samples, we have to divide everything by 1,703. So our tolerable misstatement with regard to our sample is 117.44. We're going to divide that between beta risk and alpha risk. Okay. Uh, the risk, alpha risk is what? Uh, the, the risk that we issue an adverse opinion when the financial statements are fairly presented. And beta risk is the risk that we issue an unmodified opinion when inventory is materially overstated. So we're going to split this tolerable misstatement. We're going to allocate it between the two. Part of it's going to be beta risk. So the, the part on the left, the bottom graph on the left, uh, that uh, the allowance for sampling risk is beta risk. Uh, the little arrow on the top uh, is alpha risk. Also keep in mind that we're, we're going to pretend, it's not true, but we're going to pretend that we're going to build a confidence interval around the book value. Confidence intervals are typically two tail. So we're going to deal with Z alpha over two. When we look up our Z score, we're going to look up Z alpha over two because it's going to get split between the lower tail and the upper tail. When we're doing our hypothesis test, they're typically one tail. So the hypothesis test beta is going to be a one tail test. Uh, the alpha portion is going to be a two tail test. Keep that in mind. Okay, the, the next work paper shows how we calculate our sample size. Now, notice we calculated the sample size in the planning phase before we knew our sample results. So if I look at the uh, work last page, the page I had to tear off, uh, we can see that the standard deviation that we're given is 860.152. In the planning phase, that's all we know. We haven't taken a sample yet. We don't know what the sample standard deviation is going to be. So that's why we use 861. Now, the partner set alpha risk as 30. Remember, that's two tail. 
and beta risk as 0.05. So beta is going to be 1.64, z-score of 1.645, and alpha is going to be a z-score of 1.06. Because uh, alpha risk is 30%, but we're, it's two tail, so 15% will go into each tail, 15 in the upper, 15 in the lower. Uh, we plug into that formula that was at the very first line of the, the handout, uh, and we plug into that formula, and we get n equal to 386.8. We always round up. If it had been 386.1, we would still round up to 387. We always, always round up. Go to the next. Round is the wrong word, isn't it? We always go to the next integer, next higher integer. If you want to know where that formula was derived from, uh, you can follow this worksheet through. What we essentially do is we set the critical value for our hypothesis test equal to the lower limit of the confidence interval. And, and when we do that, the, the critical value is what we're trying to prove, the hypothetical mean plus Z beta times standard error. The lower limit equals the book value, the average book value minus Z alpha over 2 times standard error. And, and we can just rearrange that and we come up with the formula um, that was given on the very first line uh, of the handout paper. Now, once we get our sample results, we're going to do a hypothesis test. At this point in time, we're done with the confidence. We're no longer worried about alpha risk. All we're worried about now is beta risk, 0.05. So we use alpha risk and beta risk to determine the sample size. But once we've determined the sample size and we perform the test, then all we're worried about anymore is beta risk. So our sample size, our sample results were a sample mean of 1141. And the standard deviation of our sample was 880. Because the sample standard deviation equal exceeds the standard deviation of the book values, I'm going to use the larger of the two. In order to be conservative, I'm going to use the larger of the two. So I calculate my critical value, what I'm trying to prove, the 1036 plus Z beta for 0.05% times the standard error divided by the square, square root of N. And when I calculate that, I get a critical value of 1,110.33. Since my sample mean exceeds the critical value, I'm comfortable. The risk of me reaching the wrong conclusion is 0 .0, less than 0 0.05. Right? That's what it means. When it exceeds a critical value, since I use 0 0.05 uh, as to calculate my critical value, the 1.645, that represents the 0 0.05. So I'm 95, more than 95% confident that inventory is not materially overstated. Here's an alternate work paper to present the results in the same way that page 251 and 252 result presented the results. It's a little bit different. It's the exact same result. You get the same result. So, so in this case, my sample, my book value is 1154. My sample mean is 1141. That's a $13.18 overstatement. I multiply everything by 1703. My projected misstatement is 22,437. So my projected misstatement is 22,437. Is that anywhere close to my tolerable misstatement? No. So my projected misstatement's 22,000. My tolerable misstatement's 200,000. I could probably be comfortable. But I'm trying to teach statistics, so I'm um, I'm not going to be.
and 251, 252, they said you have to add an allowance for sampling risk to your projected misstatement. My allowance for sampling risk, if I think of the critical value, my hypothetical mean plus Z beta times S of X over the square root of N, that Z beta times S of X over the square root of, that's my allowance. That's my allowance for sampling risk, that little interval. That little interval is not little. So when I multiply that out, I get 73.59. I have to project that. How do I do that? I multiply by 1703. My allowance for sampling risk is 125,323. So when I add my allowance to sampling risk to my projected error, it totals 147 which is still less than my tolerable misstatement of 200,000. So I'm comfortable. There's less than a 5% risk that I'm going to reach the wrong conclusion. That wraps up statistical sampling. Uh, make sure you study the handout. Get with me if you have any questions. Uh, I hope you're having a great quarter.